Welcome everybody to the Rolla Public Library. My name is Derek and today I'll be interviewing Chuck Haddix, author of Bird, The Life and Music of Charlie Parker. Enjoy. Chuck Haddix is an author, radio host, and director of the Mars Sound Archives, which is a collection of 340,000 historic sound recordings related to the history of Kansas City, Missouri. Since the 1980s, many jazz and blues fans in Kansas City have enjoyed Chuck's radio show called Fish Fry, which is aired from 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. on NPR's flagship station, KCUR, in Kansas City. He's also an educator who has taught at the Kansas City Art Institute. Today, we're honored to feature Chuck in our series of interviews with top-notch authors who have written about topics or people relevant to Missouri's colorful and interesting heritage. <laughs> we'll be talking about his book, The Life and Music of Bird, which explores the life of bebop jazz saxophonist Charlie Parker. Chuck, thanks so much for being here today. I'm glad to be here with you, Derek. Thanks for having me on your program. So Charlie Parker is considered a legend in musicians across the board, many different genres. What are some of the key reasons why he's such a revered figure? Well, I think the main reason is because he was a brilliant improviser and composer, but also he changed the course of music. Like Mozart, he's a transitional figure in music. There's music before Charlie Parker and there's music after Charlie Parker. He changed everything with the invention of bebop. Now, you mentioned in the book that Parker launched his professional career with a group called the Chords of Rhythm in 1935. In what ways did Charlie Parker grow as a professional musician while he was in Kansas City? Well, Charlie Parker came of age as a man and a musician in Kansas City. There was a tradition where older musicians would pass on the tradition to younger musicians in jam sessions. And he's very much a product of that. Also, Lincoln High School had an outstanding music program, and he attended Lincoln and studied with Leo Davis. Uh, and he's the culmination of the Kansas City tradition. When you're looking at Kansas City, um, I did another book called Kansas City Jazz from Ragtime to Bebop for Oxford Press in 2006. And if you look at the music of Kansas City, it evolves in a very short period of time from ragtime to bebop in a 20-year period of time between 1920 and 1940. In 1920, James Scott, who was known as the Little Professor, who was a ragtime composer, wrote Don't Jazz Me Rag on Music. But in 1940, Charlie Parker was playing bebop here in Kansas City. The older musicians called it crazy music. It really didn't have a, a name yet. But he he created this pretty much on his own, although Dizzy Gillespie gets a lot of the credit, as he should, for refining it. But Bird was, a, he's a culmination of the Kansas City tradition. Uh, he, everything he played was based in the blues, just like uh, Count Basie and Jay McShann. Uh, so he is a, uh, he's, he's a culmination of the Kansas City tradition. Why would bebop be called crazy music to somebody who maybe has never heard it before? Because it was so radically different than what had been played before. You know, Charlie Parker came up in the swing era with, with, uh, with, the, with the band of Jay McShann's band. Jay McShann's band was a hard swinging band that played Kansas City style jazz, which is distinguished by a 4-4 rhythm and uh, sections riffing, the sax and trumpet section riffing against solos, soloists. And so he comes up out of that tradition, but he took a different approach musically using 16th notes, it took different harmonic approach. And also he was an improviser. He made, it was art on the spot. He'd made up songs on the spot. So it was a radical departure from what had been played before with the swing era. And he and Dizzy Gillespie and the other pioneers of bebop, in many ways, bebop is a reaction to the swing 
movement because when you were playing swing music, you didn't really get to solo. So they gathered in small groups after hours and, and, and jammed together and improvised together. And that's where bebop comes. And it's not a music for dancers like swing music. It's a music that you sit down and listen to. And it's not, you know, by chance that the, the whole um, Jack Kerouac and the other, other beat generation picked up on bebop. It was just a radical departure, much like the literature was a radical departure. And also, Charlie Parker influenced not only the mu uh, subsequent musicians that would follow, ranging from Moondog, a street musician in New York City, to the Red Hot Chili Peppers, but he also inspired a whole generation of writers, dancers, painters, and other artists, too. Uh, and he's, he's kind of a mythical figure in, in American culture. Uh, also, you know, the bird, there's always these great stories about bird. One of the big challenges I had when writing about Charlie Parker was stripping away the myths surrounding Charlie Parker to get to what he was like as a man and an artist. There's a story you relate in the book where Charlie Parker is playing at the Reno club in Kansas city. And he's playing a jazz standard called Honeysuckle Rose. And during the performance of that, that jazz standard, he fumbles it. And there's a drummer and, and there's a whole story there. And I'm wondering, could you tell us a bit about that story? And what, how did Charlie Parker's response to that story? What, what does that reflect about his dedication as a musician? Well, Charlie Parker uh, haunted the clubs on 12th Street, including the Reno Club. And the Reno Club uh, had a late night jam session called a spook breakfast. And of course, the Count Basie band was playing at, at the Reno Club when Charlie was come, Parker was coming up, 1935, 1936, when he was 15, 16 years old. And Charlie was not musically proficient at the time. And he decided to take a chance and sit in on the jam session. And he faltered while soloing in Honeysuckle Rose. And these jam sessions, I might add, were a test of a young musician's manhood in a lot of ways. And they're metal. And he, and he faltered while soloing Honeysuckle Rose. And Joe Jones, the drummer of the group, threw a, a cymbal at his feet and kind of gonged him, if you will. And he was laughed off stage. And he vowed he would never get ca caught short again. And he went home. And he, he uh, rehearsed his saxophone for as much as 12 to 14 hours a day at his mother's home. And he learned all the chord changes, the inversions, and just mastered his horn. There's, there's really three watershed incidents in Charlie's life. And one of them is the humiliation at the Reno Club. And the second is the following fall, in fall of 1936, on Thanksgiving Day, he was on his way to play a job at Musser's Ozarks Tavern with the Union Band. And that was located five miles south of Eldon, which is basically southeast of Kansas City. And on the way, he uh, the car he was riding in uh, hit a slick spot, flipped over, and broke his ribs and his back. And it threw his friend Ernest Daniels 60 feet into a plowed field and killed George Wilkerson, who was the leader of the date. And when he came back to Kansas City, he got, a, he, he got to recuperate. Two things happened. He got a new horn. His horn was, according to Lawrence Keyes, ragged as a pet monkey. <laughs> his horn was in terrible shape. So he got a new horn. That gave him a lift. But he also picked up a habit, heroin habit, because the doctors gave him heroin to ease the pain. And that time, not much was really known about heroin. And they thought it was a safe alternative to morphine. And so he became addicted to heroin when he was 16 years old. And he struggled with heroin, his addiction, the rest of his life until he would pass at 34. And the third incident, when he went to New York in 1938, and uh went to uh, follow Buster Smith to New York, who was his musical hero. And while in, we was jamming in a, in a, at a jam session in Harlem at a place called Wall's Chili Shack, he was able to, for the first time to play the music that he was hearing in his head. And then when he returned to Kansas City, he was reportedly a changed man. So those are the three big incidences, watershed period incidences in Charlie's life. 
Do you believe that the role of Kansas City, Missouri often gets overlooked when we're talking about the legacy of Charlie Parker? Yes, I do. Um, you know, when I did my Kansas City book, I went through the Kansas City call from 1919 to 1943 and made copies of all the music references. And I gathered together all the in, all the interviews I could get my hands on. And it became quite apparent to me that there's this myth about Charlie Parker in Kansas City that Charlie Parker was put upon. He was never appreciated in Kansas City. And what I found out was a different story. Charlie Parker was a, a big star with the Harlan Leonard band. He was a star with, with, with Jay McShann's band. He was billed as a saxophone supremacist. And um, so when I did the Kansas City book, I wrote two chapters on Charlie Parker after I finished the, the narrative for the, the Kansas City book. And reviewing the, the current literature of the time, I realized that Kansas City and, and with Charlie Parker had been given short shrift. So that's one of the reasons I wrote the Kansas City book is Kansas City jazz had been given the short shrift in jazz histories. And then I wrote the Charlie Parker book because his story in Kansas City had not been told. And he lived in Kansas City for the first 20 years of his life. He only lived to be 34. And the, the biographies that have been published over the years really don't cover his time in Kansas City. And this is this is where he really this is where he spent his formative years. And, I, and that story needed to be told. While in Kansas City, Parker actually had some musical mentors, as you say, it was this idea of passing the tradition on to the younger musicians. One of those mentors was Buster Smith. What was the role of Buster Smith in Charlie's musical development? Well, Buster Smith was a member of the Blue Devils, and he came to Kansas City with the legendary territorial band, the Blue Devils. And he worked with... Uh, Benny Moten's band, along with Count Basie. And then when Count Basie formed his band at the Reno Club in 1935, after Benny's death in July of 35, he brought Buster Smith aboard as an arranger. And Buster played alto saxophone and clarinet. And so Charlie Parker idolized Buster Smith because he attended these late night spook breakfasts where Buster Smith was featured. And he would follow Buster Smith around and beg Buster Smith to show him how, how to do things. And Buster would show him how, how to go in and out of key and how to play double time and all the tricks of the trade that the musicians use in these late night sessions. And then in 1938, when Charlie returned from his trip to New York City, Buster, that spring of 38, Buster Smith was playing at Lucille's Paradise on 18th Street, which was a very popular club. It was located upstairs next to the Kansas City Call building, the newspaper building. And Charlie and played alongside Buster Smith nightly, and he really learned all of the all of the the, the tricks that, that Buster Smith knew and had developed over the years. Uh, and he, and he, and Buster Smith said that anything Buster could play, anything he could play, Charlie could play better. In fact, Jay Mc, there used to be a, a station that broadcast, radio station that broadcast out of there, uh, KXBY. And it was an AM station it could be picked up all over the Midwest. And one time, uh, Jay McShann told, told Smith, he said, Smith, he goes, he goes, prof, everybody calling professor Smith. He said, you sounded good last night. And Smith said, that wasn't me. That was Charlie Parker. I was not on that gig last night. So he really learned from Charlie Parker and also watching Lester Young, who he idolized, uh, Ephra G. Ware, who uh, was a guitarist also, uh, worked with Charlie too. So he, he drew from a wide variety of, 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 in, of sources in Kansas City musicians, but Buster Smith was his main influence. And Buster Smith has not been well documented on records, but if you go back and listen to some of his records from the 1930s, you can hear Charlie Parker. Wonderful. Could you give us an idea about what learning, it, it sounds like it's a lot of hands-on learning for musicians in Kansas City. Can you give us an idea of that kind of climate? Yeah, well, the there was there were two two ways to learn music in Kansas City. There were a lot of private uh, teachers, Charles Watts, uh, Clyde Glass, and so these 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 were schooled musicians. They came up in in grade school. They would they would learn music in grade school, and then they would also do their kind of finishing work at Lincoln High School 
And Western University also had a very strong music program. And all of the early Kansas City jazz greats studied at Lincoln High School, a lot of them under Major N. Clark Smith, who was a disciplinarian, taught military science as well as band. And so these are musicians, Julia Lee, Walter Page, Harlan Leonard, uh, Benny Moten, they all came out of the Lincoln High School music program. And they learned to play classical music. So these are musicians who could play classical music as well as jazz. And Smith didn't teach jazz, but he didn't, he, he, he fostered the, the, the advancement of jazz. Like for example, um, in Kansas city, uh, Walter Page was a upright bass player and the bass was owned by Lincoln high school. If he had a gig on the weekend, Smith would let him take the bass home so he could play that gig. And then, uh, you know, uh, Smith also spoke at J at a memorial service for James Reese Europe in Chicago. And Reese was the one that incorporated ragtime and jazz into the concert band tradition. So these were school musicians. And then the older musicians passed the tradition on to the younger musicians uh, through these informal jam sessions and through contact. There was a uh, Kansas City was one of the few cities in this area that had an African-American um, musicians union, local 627. They were affiliated with the national union and there were two unions, 627, the African-American and the white union was union 34, local number 34. And so they had their own headquarters, which was a gathering spot for musicians. And they fielded as much as eight bands and the, the 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 musicians union grew very rapidly. It was there were like 87 members in 1927, and by 1930 they had over 300 members. As the as the bands from the southwestern territories came into Kansas City, and so there was a whole concentration of music here in Kansas City. And these older musicians passed the tradition on to these younger musicians. So there was there was an unofficial and official educational system. You talk in the book about two recordings, Margie, and I'm getting sentimental over you, which were made. They, they weren't like Charlie didn't go into like Dial Studios and record them. They were made, um, but they were made when he was in Kansas City. And what do they demonstrate about Charlie Parker's skill as a soloist uh, before he goes over to New York? Well, th these were these were recorded in February of 1941 before Charlie recorded for the Decca label, made his landmark recording uh, Hootie Blues for the Decca label. And John Tamino, who managed the Jay McShann band, had a home disc cutting machine. In those days, uh, they would you could make your own records. You'd go into a, an arcade and make a record, and or you could have a portable unit where you could record off the radio or record using a microphone. And the discs are called lacquer discs. They're cellulose acetate over a metal core. And these were becoming pretty common by the early 1940s. And John Tamino kind of liked gadgets. So he got this and he was recording the band to get them ready for their recording session in Dallas, Texas in April of 1941. And the, the band was playing at that time at the Century Room, which was located on Broadway. And they were playing um, for white dancers. And they, they would maintain several books. They would play differently for the dancers at the Century Room. They would play more pop standards and things like that. Whereas when they were playing at, at say, for example, the Paseo Hall or the clubs on the east side of town, they would play swing music and blues. And so John Tamino cut two discs, cut a two-sided disc of the band. And if one of them is Margie, which is Margie, I'm always thinking of you. And it's pretty standard for what they'd be playing for the century room. And then I'm getting sentimental over you. It starts off with a vocal by Joel Coleman, who is a vocalist with the band. And it's very straight. And then Charlie takes a solo where all of the tricks, all his his innovations are on display. 16th note, double time, going in and out of key. And it's a revelation. And it had never been published, but it's available now 
on a website called Saxophone Supreme, The Life and Music of Charlie Parker. Uh, it's from an, uh, an online exhibit from a physical exhibit that I did last year for his centennial. And you can hear it online. If you, you can go online, it's, 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 it's amazing because he had not, he had met Dizzy Gillespie the previous year, but he had not worked with Dizzy Gillespie, He'd been to New York, but nobody was playing music like that. It shows that he, he was playing bebop here in Kansas city that had been long, uh, stated by musicians that he'd been playing bebop, but this is proof of it. So it's a very important recording. You mentioned proof. Uh, uh, when you play the role of a historian, why is it important to look for documents that actually show, or, or documentation and, and artifacts even, that demonstrate what people are saying to be true? Well, I mean, the, 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 I think it's important to tell what happened and tell accurately and truthfully what happened. Part of the problem, one of the challenges of writing about Charlie Parker is the previous biographies, particularly Ross Russell's a sensationalized his life. And it was, they were all based upon oral history rather than uh, research. And you didn't have to, what I decided right away is I didn't have to sensationalize Charlie Parker because he did enough of that on his own. And so I wanted to tell his story uh, and uh, chronologically, uh, fairly and truthfully. And I was able to do so because of the, my work in the call and because of my interviews and interviews Frank Driggs gave me of uh, uh, people that that knew Charlie Parker, uh, you know, and there's a very different portrait of him in these various, various books. And I, I tried to um, straighten it out and tell just tell it straight ahead. And the same time my book was published, Stanley Cowell's. Stanley Crouch's rather book was published and Stanley uh, basically wrote a novel <laughs> about Charlie Parker. It wasn't, there was no research, there's no end notes. I mean, I, I wanted to write a scholarly treatment of the subject, but I wanted to be able to read well and to be entertaining. And I think that that was my goal. And I think that's what I accomplished. Now, when Charlie Parker, so he made these this Margie, and I'm getting sentimental over you. We know that he's he's learning his his skills as a soloist. When did he migrate to New York City, and how did his time there define his legacy? Well, you know, the goal of all the musicians in Kansas City, a lot of musicians in Kansas City, beginning with Benny Moten, was to go to New York City and make it because that's where the entertainment industry was centered at that time. Uh, the, the, you know, recording industry was there. Uh, all the clubs were there. That was where you went to make it. And he, there's some question in my mind, if he would have gotten out of town, if it hadn't been for Jay McShann, the Jay McShann band is the last great big African-American band to come out of Kansas city. And they had a hit record with a, a Hootie Blues and Confessing the Blues. Confessing the Blues was the big hit, but Hootie Blues contained the first commercial solo by Charlie Parker. And the musicians who heard it were astounded because it was so different than any other alto saxophone, saxophone player in, in the country. And so on the strength of that record, he was known nationally. So the Jay McShann band relocated to New York City in December of 1941. And they got there just ahead of the, the tide of the war. Uh, while they were on their way, literally Pearl Harbor was bombed and America entered the war. But they were able, because they were, they were affiliated with Mo Gale, they were able to play top uh, venues in the Savoy Ballroom. Uh, and the home of Happy Feet up in Harlem. And there were broadcasts done from the Savoy, from the stage of Savoy, that captured Bird as the star soloist with the, 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 the band. And so musicians would gather around the stage to watch for Charlie Parker. And he became, you know, a big star like that. And then, of course, Dizzy Gillespie was in, in, um, in New York City, and Dizzy was moving in the same direction as Charlie Parker, as were other modernists, such as uh, Thelonious Monk, Bud Powell, Kenny Clark. 
and they were all they were all like-minded musicians gathered together and that's really where bebop was born and so he you know he's affiliated with kansas city he grew up here but he, when he went to new york that's really where he blossomed because of the recording industry there and because of all the clubs that were there and that's where he really entered the national spotlight it was it was his time in new york so he, and he loved New York. Uh, you know, he loved the rhythms of the city. Uh, it wasn't as Jim Crow as, as Kansas City could be at that time. Uh, you know, Harlem was happening. Very exciting time to be in New York. And also his affiliation with Dizzy Gillespie was very fruitful. And they uh, were able to uh, record at a time when it was difficult to record because of the war and also because James Petrillo, who's the head of the American Federation of Musicians called a recording band. So it was New York city where he really blossomed. Uh, and there were stumbles along the way. Um, in, I think it was 1945, I believe that Dizzy and, um, and, uh, Charlie went to, to, uh, Los Angeles and they took their group there. They, they were, had an on and off relationship there. They played together for short while, and then they would break up, and then they would, they'd form another group. And so Charlie and Dizzy went to New York, to, went to California, rather, Los Angeles, to open in a place called Billy Berg's. And they, the audiences in, in, in Los Angeles weren't prepared for the bebop. The musicians got it, but the, the fans didn't in the club, in Billy Berg's. And when... The band came back to New York City, Dizzy and the rest of the band members. Charlie stayed in California. And um, he there was a shortage of heroin, and he went into withdrawals, and he started drinking heavily. And he had a, a nervous breakdown. And he, he, he had struggled with mental issues as well as alcoholism, uh, poor health, and drugs his whole life. And he had a, a breakdown and Ross Russell, who recorded him for the uh, dial label and the, and a, 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 and a, another friend uh, who, who was financing the dial level, got him into the, the state mental hospital at Camarillo where he received treatments. You know, in those days, uh, if you were an African American or white guy, who was a, a junkie, you get thrown in jail. You would not, there was not, there was no Betty Ford clinics. It was all punishment. It was not rehabilitation, but he got clean and it probably saved his life. And then when he returned to New York city, he returned in triumph and he began leading his own group and recording for the Savoy label Verve. And it was a very fertile time for him at that time. Uh, and of course he had married Doris and uh, Doris is uh, his third wife. And she provided a stable home life for him. So, and then later, of course, he married Chan and had a family with Chan and he became a family man. He was, you know, Charlie Parker's is the ultimate hipster and all that, according to people, but he was really kind of a square. He liked, he liked, if you look at his music collection, there's like Tommy Dorsey records in there. Uh, he liked riding the train, pretending he was a businessman, reading the newspaper. Uh, you know, uh, he, very complicated individual and fascinating to write about, fascinating to write about and research. I'll never forget when I was reading an interview with Charlie Parker and he got on there and he said a lot of jazz music, he, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but he said a lot of jazz musicians like to live the lifestyle, but they don't like to read the books and do the study and put in the practice. And I was like, wow, he's like, like, you're getting the like Charlie Parker, you you get like this idea like, oh, it's, you know, he's late night jams and drinking and heroin and all this. But no, it, I mean, he, he's like going, he's like, you need to put in the time and study and practice. And I was thinking, wow, it's there's a, a really good work ethic here behind that that often doesn't get showcased. Oh, yeah. He, he when he was on out in, on the road with uh, with uh, with on with these caravans that they used to have these jazz to fill shows he'd he'd pour over and then with billy Eckstein and with earl father hines he'd pour over stravinsky scores indeed when one night when he was in a club and stravinsky was at, at the table sitting at one of the tables he quoted rights of spring 
and by a spring, by the spring. And uh, Stravinsky went crazy because Charlie Parker's recording him. He's and he was he loved classical music. He loved Bartok. He was musically he was he was very well versed, very well versed. And like the musicians in Kansas City that passed the tradition on to Charlie, Charlie passed the musicians on the tradition on to the next generation of musicians. Uh, Hampton Hawes and the other Frank Morgan and the other younger musicians in um, in Los Angeles will tell you that that they learned what they knew, need to know from Charlie Parker. He would always mentor along younger musicians too, and he was very tolerant because of his humiliation at at the Reno Club. He was very tolerant of musicians who were not as quote accomplished as he was. Do you think that comes from his Kansas City upbringing? I think so. I think so. You know, you it's giving back to the community. And he um he really gave back to the community. And I think I think just that whole the way things were done in Kansas City, when when you're from Kansas City and you, a lot of musicians have told me this, particularly Claude Fiddler Williams. Kansas City has a very distinct sound. So Kansas City musicians have a very distinct sound. So when you travel you have what is called the Kansas City stamp. And when you're at a jam session and you're playing a jam session, musicians can always tell that you're from Kansas City by the way you play. And Charlie had that, you know. I mean, he had the Kansas City stamp. And he's a culmination of the Kansas City jazz tradition. If we could step back for a moment, what is your own background in Kansas City and why, when did you get the idea, you know, I, I need to write a book about Charlie Parker. The world needs another book about Charlie Parker. Well, I, um, originally I was from North of the river. I grew up North of the river. And, um, while I was in uh, college, I used to uh, go to a club on main street called Milton's tap room. And Milton Morris was, uh, an old gangster in Kansas City in the 1920s and 1930s, it became very charming and very respectable. And he ran, ran a jazz and jazz joint. And he played records. He had his fabulous record collection. He played nothing but jazz in there. And I used to go hang out with Milton a lot. Uh, and it was a very kind of a dark place. Charlie Parker played for Milton. Milton had all these fabulous stories. I mean, he owned, he owned the Hey Hey Club. Uh, he owned M Milton's on Truce. He was he was a, the genuine article. He was a Kansas City club owner who lived to the 70s and 80s, still operated clubs. And Milton used to tell all these fantastic stories about Kansas City jazz. I mean, he would hold forth for hours and tell people about, you know, what a swinging place for swinging people. He'd also run, to his character, he'd run for governor get as many as 10,000 votes on the legalized gambling bingo and gambling ticket. And so I started hanging out at, at Milton's. And then I went to work after I left college and I went to work in the record business and I managed a record store called Penny Lane and it was in Westport and it was the largest, one of the largest record stores in Kansas city and it specialized in jazz. And so all the musicians like Jay McShann and step buddy Anderson and all these jazz legends would come in and hang out and buy records from me. And I would talk to them too. And so I got to know Jay McShann and he'd talk about bird and this and bird that. And then I, uh, uh, then I, I started hanging out at the mutual musicians foundation, which is the old headquarters for local 627. And they would host these jam sessions starting at one o'clock in the morning on Friday and Saturday going all night long. And of course I was single and pretty fat foot loose and fancy free in those days. And so I'd go down there and listen to these, these more stories about Kansas City jazz and the old guys were hanging out. All these jazz legends were hanging out down there. People that knew Charlie Parker personally. And they, I would talk to them and listen to the music being played. And it, it really excited me. You know, and I've been listening to jazz for a long time, but and then I decided that, um, uh, you know, that I started doing research on Kansas City jazz, just talking to people. And then I went to work in 1980, and then I began doing a jazz program in 1985 called The Jazz Place on KCUR. And, you know, I, I was on jazz doing, I was jazz disc jockey from 
10 o'clock to two o'clock in the morning, late night jazz DJ. I mean, that, that's, 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 uh, every, every jazz fans dream. And then in 1987, I continued doing research on Kansas City jazz and reading everything I could about it. And then in 1987, I, 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 for a point, for a period, I went back to school and I studied with a guy called Gaylord Marr, who was in the communication studies department, and he taught the history of the media. And Gaylord had this fabulous collection of recordings in his home, like 34,000 recordings in his home. And he was a pioneer of using audiovisual material in the classroom. And Gaylord became my mentor. And then in 1986, the Miller Nichols Library accepted Gaylord's collection to establish what became known as the Mars Sound Archive. And so I went to work for, I was hired in 1980. I, w I went to work for the library in 1987. There was room with nothing in it. Now there's room with 450,000 records in it. We're known for a jazz collection. And I began to, I, I'm collecting material for the library. When collecting material for the library, I uh, was able to, to garner a number of archival collections, including the Dave Dexter Jr. collection. Dave Dexter was the first to write about Kansas City jazz, the first to write a, a history of jazz, and he was he was the first employee Capitol Records. He produ produced a lot of Kansas City jazz musicians for Capitol. He also acquired the Beatles for Capitol Records. And Dave became my mentor as well as Milton Morris. And Dexter was living in California at the time. So I talked to Dexter a lot and he would tell me about Kansas City jazz and I would interview him. And then also I got the uh, John Tamino collection. And that's where, of course, the lacquer came from. And Tamino was a booking agent and he had all this fabulous collection. And then, you know, all the musicians as they would pass, their collections would come here. And I wanted to get the Frank Driggs record Frank Driggs collection. Frank was in New York. He was the leading scholar on collector and scholar on, on Kansas City jazz and also on uh, jazz in this territorial tradition. And Frank had this fabulous collection of photographs and also records. And I wanted to get the, um, I wanted to bring his collection to Kansas City. I wanted to meet him. And when Robert Altman's film, um, Kansas City was filmed here in Kansas City. I did. I was a consultant on that, and uh, because I had the collections, I had the music, and I knew a lot about Kansas City jazz. I had I'd written articles. I began as a writer, writing for a local publication called The Pitch, a weekly publication covering music. I started that in 1980, so I was already a writer, and that's I was a jazz columnist for The Pitch, and so when. Robert Altman came to town to film Kansas City. He asked me if I would help out. And so I did. And I was a consultant on that. And it was it was quite a heady time because it was centered around this legendary jam session in Kansas City history called the Legendary Cutting Contest. And Frank Driggs put out this, this he was working for Columbia Records, and he put out this, the real Kansas City. And he made mistakes in his narrative, in the writing, in his history. And I wrote him and, and corrected him and said, by the way, you know, this happened then, now, then not now, you know. And uh, so I went to New York for a conference and I met Frank Driggs. And Frank had a contract to write a history of Kansas City Jazz for Oxford University Press dating back to 1977. And Frank was not a writer. He was a writer, but he was not, he didn't do big projects. And his, girlf his girlfriend was a good writer. She, she would, you know, he was a collector. And he, it was a real sticking point between him and Oxford because he'd had his con contract and he had blown past deadline after deadline to do it. And he'd written a couple of chapters, but they were very thin chapters. And we started talking about Kansas City Jazz at a very high level. And he um, invited me to, uh, to complete the book with him. So Oxford issued a new contract and brought me into it. And I written columns i'd written articles for like uh, the jazz ambassador magazine and things like that about kansas City jazz i'd written quite a bit but I'd never written a book and so frank knew that the story was in the kansas city call which was the african-american newspaper so i went through the kansas city call from 1919 to 1943 and made copies of all the music references and then created a timeline 
and also I gathered together all of the um, all of the interviews I could get my hands on that were published, and Frank had interviews too. And so I started writing. Frank didn't write any of the book. I wrote the whole thing. He proofed it and and approved it. Uh, and so I wove together the information from the call with these great stories and narrative and to tell the story of Kansas City Jazz. And I wrote it to be episodic like you would a screenplay because I'm telling a lot of stories at once and I'm telling the story of a, of, of a town too. And so when Count Basie leaves town uh, and Andy Kirk comes back, the, 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 the focus switches to him. And it became very apparent to me the significance of Kansas City Jazz and it had been overlooked. So, you know, once I did the Kansas City book, I, learned, I found my voice as a writer when I did the Kansas City book. I, um, after the second rewrite of the manuscript, I gave it to Steve Paul, who writes for the Kansas City Star as a writer, a, a note. And Steve Paul said, I don't smell 18th Street. I don't see it. I don't taste it. And I was taken back. I thought, well, I'm, I'm pretty hot shit. You know, what, what, is, what is he telling me? You know, this isn't for good. And uh, then I, I thought about it. I thought, well, maybe it could use a few adjectives. And so during during the rewrite of the third chapter, early in the th rewrite, I found my voice as a writer. And, and that's the place you want to be. When you sit down, it's like midnight. You're writing. You're all alone. And. There's nothing that gets in the way between your thoughts and what you're writing. You're not thinking about it. You're, you've got the research and you're writing it. So that's where I really found my voice as a writer. And then when I, I did the, um, when I wrote, did the final draft, I wrote two chapters on Charlie Parker. And then I reviewed the literature and I realized that he had not been given his due, that his story had not been told. And particularly a story in Kansas City, because when Ross Russell wrote about jazz down in Kansas City in the Southwest, he never came here. He did he did all his research remotely. Didn't he didn't use primary sources. He just used oral histories, and he borrowed a lot from my co-author Frank Driggs, who'd published a lot of in of articles about Kansas City jazz over the years. There was a real bad blood between Russell and Frank Driggs, and so I I decided and but he knew Charlie Parker, but he was mad at Charlie Parker because Parker quit recording for the dial label. And so he, Russell originally started out to write a scholarly work on Charlie Parker. And then he ran into Albert Goldman, who's Elvis's biographer. Albert convinced him to sensationalize Charlie Parker's life. And that's what he did. And it came at the cost of telling Charlie Parker's story. And I know this because I went through the Ross Russell collection. As part of my research, I cast my net very wide when I was researching for the Charlie Parker book and went for, you know, original resources. And I actually went in and read uh, Ross Russell's early chapters that were never published here, the, the first drafts. And they were quite good. But, you know, and then it's just unfortunately, he just he didn't he didn't do bird justice. And it's a little intimidating to write about one of the greatest musicians of all time. I mean, if you don't get it right, and everybody's reading it, you know, uh, if you don't get it right, you hear about it. You know? Yeah, and that that makes a lot of sense. I'm I'm wondering what is what is the difficulty of of trying to bring these people to life? Uh, you mentioned that he's like, I can't smell the street. You know, I can't smell the the streets. I can't smell the clubs. What is it like to try to bring these people and these places to life through the written word? It's, I go to a subconscious place. I'm not consciously thinking about it when I'm writing. I'm just writing. Uh, I think you have to give you have, first of all, you have to assume that you're, you're, Reader doesn't know anything about the subject. So you have to give them the background. Like in my Kansas City book, I start with a real lurid portrait of Kansas City to get their attention. And then I tell them why it happened in Kansas City. And then I tell them what happened. With Charlie Parker, uh, Charlie Parker biography begins with his death. A clap of thunder heralded the passing of Charlie Parker. You know, and it's like uh, Citizen Kane with Rosebud. 
And, you know, and then when writing about, you know, Kansas City, I have to, you know, there's two Kansas Cities, Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri. Bird was born in Kansas City, Kansas, became of age in, in, as a man and musician in Kansas City, Missouri. But most readers don't know anything about that. So I had to detail the kind of differences between Kansas City, Kansas and Kansas City, Missouri without insulting Kansas City, Kansas, because I like Kansas City, Kansas. But it's a different place. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's in a dry state at one time. You know, they had very restrictive uh, liquor laws. Uh, it was a state of Puritans, really, and it and it did not cultivate the clubs and the music scene that Kansas City, Missouri did. But it's just right across the river, so you know that's you know so that that's that's kind of like the challenge, and also to tell it truthfully, but tell it in a lively lively voice. You know, once you find your voice as a writer, it's a very liberating thing. I've been rereading my uh, my Kansas City book. I'm teaching Kansas City Jazz History at the Art Institute. I've been teaching that for years on a fall semester. And each year I go back and read it. And there's some things I would change, but some things are like, hey, that's really good. You know, I really did that very well. <laughs> you know, uh, one thing I like to do, I like to publish online. Uh, the Saxophone Supreme exhibit was fun to do because I could put a whole lot of stuff, more stuff in there. And also, if you if you want to change something, you can go back and change it. It's not a problem. That's true. You can grow more easily. It's not just like there for all the time. I'm wondering what can people learn by visiting uh, the Saxophone Supreme exhibit that you have there? It's not just like like an article. Can you tell us a bit more about the um, the multifaceted um, aspect of that page and why people would learn what people well, would learn from it? It tells the story of Charlie Parker, um, and it's it's like a Cliff Notes version of my book. You know, it's based upon my research, but it's when, you know, it, the challenge of writing of online is being brief. I had to, I had to keep each panel. And originally it was a panel, you know, t 12 panels and each panel could only, I could only include 350 words. And when I did my Kansas city book, I learned and more per, when, with Charlie Parker, I learned how to edit myself. And a lot of writers don't have the objectivity to edit themselves. I do. So I was able to edit things down to 350 50 words. And it tells Charlie's story. But also I was able to include items that were not included in the book, like uh, articles from the call. Uh, at, I was able to draw from William Gottlieb's collection, Library of Congress. Uh, I was able to draw from our collection and include a lot more images than you can include in the book. And also, I was able to put the audio up to where all you had to do is click on it. You didn't have to do the QRC code. You just click on it, and you can listen to the music and representative samples. Uh, also, you know, from from the from the start, you can grow it too, and grow it into a bigger project. Right now, I'm working on um, Charlie Parker's Kansas City, which is a virtual tour of sites associated with Charlie Parker. And I've already finished 18th and Vine, and it's it and it's it's a it's a you can do, use it on your phone or your computer or your your tablet, and you can go to these places and look and see what you you can visit these places or associated with them, see what they look like in those days, other material associated with them, and then see what they look like today using Google Maps. So it's a virtual mapping of Kansas City sites associated with Charlie Parker. And that'll That'll it's it's we're just getting started on it. I've just done the first sec section, 18th and Vine, but we're going to cover the whole city, and it's up on the case Kansas City Public Library website. So it's you know it's it's uh, the research can and my research is ongoing. It's not just stopping. I learn new things just every day, you know, uh, about Kansas City jazz and about Charlie Parker. It's a lifelong you know pursuit of mine. That's wonderful. And I know the when I went and look at, looked at the exhibit, it was just amazing how it was all just there. You know, you could see you could see the newspaper ads and you could see, you know, <coughs> you know, you're, you're talking about a recording and boom, you the recording is right there and you can listen to it. So it's an amazing resource uh, for people to check out. And it, when they check out the book, you know, ch if you check what I like to do is I, I read the exhibit before I read the book. And it's a really good introduction to what the book has because it kind of brings it more to life. Uh, and you can kind of, when you're reading the book, you can kind of hear what's going on and see it better because of the the uh, multimedia aspect that was brought from the, the webpage. So that, that's really awesome. 
yeah, that really that really f fleshes out his life, and that's one thing to write about music. And it's another thing to uh, listen to it, you know, and and to to look at a musical analysis and then hear the tune. It just gives it a whole new dimension too. And music's what it's all about, you know. And, and uh, yeah, I I, I love uh, I love Charlie Parker and his music, and I was just felt compelled to tell the story because it hadn't been told. Same way with Kansas City Jazz. You know, it just just hadn't been told. So, and because I grew up here, and my experience in in the entertainment business here, record and and you know writing and all that, I I understand the subtleties of what Kansas City is all about and what the musicians and I know the story. It's just a matter of telling it. And that's what I what I try to do. What you you mentioned it's all about the music and and the story comes with the music. What recordings would you recommend to somebody who maybe has never listened to Charlie Parker or doesn't really know who that person is? What recordings would you recommend? I would recommend the dial recordings that he did for Ross Russell uh, and also the Savoy recordings. Those are Charlie Parker really at the top of his game. And the later recordings of, I like, a lot of people don't like his Bird with Strings recordings, but I do. Uh, Charlie Parker was delighted to record your strings because uh, he loved classical music and also there's some of his more successful recordings. But he play, he doesn't improvise, he plays the melody straight. So it's a very different thing. And there's, you know, there was a whole personality cult associated with Charlie Parker. <clears throat> Dean Benedetti would follow him around and he had a disc cutting machine and he would record Charlie Parker solos. And it seems like every time Charlie Parker went on stage, there was somebody in the audience recording him or there were air shots those are very rewarding too uh you know you get a little glimpse of what it was like for these late night jam sessions so but i'd, I'd start with the uh, dial sessions and move on to the savoy wonderful and how could people connect with you um wh where are you at online and and wh what can how can people if they're interested in learning more about you and your work where can they find your book and learn more about what you do well, the book's available on Amazon uh, and, and other booksellers online. It's available widely. It's just recently, uh, one, of the, one of the really kind of highlights of last year was that it was translated and published in Japan. And it was very well received. Uh, actually, I got a nice royalty check. <laughs> I'm really happy about that. But they can Google me. Uh, you know, just Google Chuck Haddix, H-A-D-D-I-X. And that'll put you in touch with our, me at the Mars Sound Archive and the radio program, and you can learn more about me that way. Uh, you can always uh, drop me an email, Haddix, H-A-D-D-I-X-C, at U-M-K-C dot E-D-U. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm the curator of the Sound Archive, so I, work, I do the Sound Archive during the week. I teach on Tuesday night, and on the weekends, it's a public radio party at the Fish Fry with Chuck Haddock. So I'm, I'm easily available and, and I'm always help, you know, like Bird and the rest of the Kansas City musicians, I'm always glad to help younger researchers with their research. Right now I'm working with and making my research available. And uh, I have quite a number of research files, let's put it that way. Right now I'm working with a young woman that's documenting uh, a women instrumentalists in Kansas City. And so she's able to come up using my research with a lot of people she never heard of. She knew, she knew a lot about it already, but she was able to kind of top it off with my research. So that, that's, that's what I, I like to pass it on to. It, it makes a difference. It, it does, Derek. Well, Chuck, is there anything that you would add to this conversation today? No, just, you know, uh, I hope, I hope you enjoy the books. Uh, you know, uh, you can't see jazz from ragtime to bebop bird, the life of music of Charlie Parker. And I'm, I've been doing research lately on a group called the Coon Sanders Original Nighthawk Orchestra. And there's also a website uh, that's hosted by Kansas City Public Library. It's called Kansas. It's called Coon Sanders Radio Pioneers, and it's a chapter in a book on Kansas City that I wrote about the Coon Sanders book. And I'm I'm kind of cogitating, as they say in Missouri, I may be writing another book about them because they came up during the 1920s and 1930s. And they become a metaphor for the history of America the exuberance uh, of the decadence of the 20s, and then the depression that follows. So I've, I've been doing research on them lately and really enjoying it. 
It sounds like a fascinating project. Can't wait to see it. Yeah. Well, Derek, it's nice talking to you. It was nice talking to you too, Chuck. Thank you so much. We're honored to have uh, had you on there, on here. And we have the book here at the library. And we also encourage you to go buy it if you have a shelf for music history, as I do. Um, buy it for your own shelf. You won't be disappointed. Thank you so much, Chuck. Thank you, Derek.